Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to Great Vic. Uh, if you're visiting with us this morning, I trust you'll feel very warmly at home among us as we gather to worship the Lord uh, as one people here in the city center. For anyone joining us online, um, uh, I trust that you'll feel welcome a part of our service as well and that you'll be encouraged as we worship God together. This evening, we're having uh, another service in the building, um, moving out of the online services or little devotions we've been doing on Sunday evening. We're having a service in the building this evening, and uh, during that service, there's going to be uh, a baptism. Emma Spears and Stephen Hogg will be baptized, God willing, during that service. So if you're able to come along, uh, please do come along, uh, and let's be prayerful uh, together uh, that God would bless us together this evening, 7 p.m. down here at the building. Wednesday evening, then, we're going to have our prayer time as usual at 7.45 down here at the church. Uh, it's such a joy to come together to pray, so just reminding you about that. Then one other announcement on Friday evening, um, Friends International, uh, who really spearhead so much international student ministry and outreach in the city, they're going to be having a celebration evening at the Majestic, which is now the new home of Windsor Baptist on the Lisburn Road, at 7.30 p.m., so 7.30 p.m., this Friday, the 21st, there's going to be that celebration. We're trying to grow uh, our uh, involvement in student ministry across the city. So if this is something that would interest you, or you would just like a chance to get in to see uh, Windsor Baptist's new building, this is a good chance for you. Um, but I'd really encourage you, if you're able to and free and you're interested in that, 7.30 at the Majestic. You do have to register online for that, just to indicate that you're planning to be there so that they can accommodate the numbers, and you'll be able to do that on the Friends International website. That's everything I have. Our church secretary has uh, an announcement for our church members, and then I'll uh, lead us in our call to worship. Okay. This is a notice for all church members. The church members' meeting will be held on Wednesday the 26th of May at 7.45. The subject matter includes church membership applications, sign and farewell, and important matters relating to the administration of this church. This is a very important meeting, and I would urge all members who can attend to be present. Attendance via Zoom will not be available, so I encourage as many as possible to come along. It is a very important meeting. The authority for calling this meeting is section 6.3 of the church constitution. Thank you. Thanks so much for that, Jimmy. Keeping us in order as usual, which is great. Well, we are here to worship the Lord. And I was just pondering this morning before I come out these wonderful words in Psalm 103, an exuberant psalm where we bless and rejoice in the Lord for all of his goodness towards us. The psalmist writes, bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your iniquity, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, and who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy. And it was this next line that really stood out to me this morning, who satisfies you with good, so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. He's here to satisfy us with good this morning. Let's pray as we commit our time to him. Father, we do pray that you would stir us so that all our inmost being would praise your holy name. And that today as we remember all the benefits we have through Jesus Christ, we pray, Lord, that you would satisfy us with good things. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together and sing of the holiness of our God.
seated. And let's bow our heads and come to this holy God now in prayer. O oh, Father, help us by your Spirit in these moments to become conscious of your holiness. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Father, what words those are. We're told here in the opening lines of the Lord's Prayer that you are our Father. We come to you this morning as our Father. And you love us. And as a father has compassion on his children, so you have compassion on those who fear you. You know us this morning. You know how we're framed. You remember that we're dust. We're fragile. We're weak. And Father, we come to you as our Father, knowing that you love us. You want to encourage us. But Father, put together with those opening words, our Father, we have the, this wonderful truth. You're our, our Father in heaven, which means you reign. You have established your throne in the heavens, and your kingdom rules over all. Our Father rules the universe. And Father, thank you that you rule our lives. We pray that your kingdom would come and your will would be done on earth as it is in heaven. We pray, Father, this morning that your kingdom would come more fully into our own lives. Your rule, your authority, your love, your grace, your peace, your joy. We pray that it would all break into our lives in a fresh new way today. We pray that your kingdom would come in our families those family members that don't know you this morning, may your kingdom break into their hearts and lives. In our land, north and south, may your kingdom come. Out in the coffee shops this morning where people are sitting and drinking coffee and, and perhaps their thoughts are far from you, may your kingdom come. And across the nations, amongst unreached peoples this morning, where there is strife and tribulation, May your kingdom come, and may your will be done. And Father, we come to you this morning to say, forgive us our sins. We confess our sins, and we ask for forgiveness this morning. Father, thank you that you do not deal with us according to our sins. You do not repay us according to our iniquities. As far as the east is from the west, that's how far you've removed our transgressions from us if we are in Christ. And Lord, we thank you so much that you take all our sins away. You set us free from the prison of condemnation through your Son. Because he broke the prison of condemnation through his glorious resurrection from the dead. And so we confess our sins, Lord, the, the pride in our lives, the self-centeredness, the forgetting you and just building our own little kingdom of the self, pushing you to the margins, forgetting you. Lord, forgive us and renew us, Lord. We also want to seek the empowering presence and work of your Holy Spirit this morning. And we want to say, Lord, we are sorry for the times when we marginalize the Holy Spirit. For we can forget so quickly that we need the Holy Spirit to be our teacher, to be the one who empowers us. We can forget that, that we need to open our hearts and lives continually and open this place to powerful ministry of your Spirit who brings life out of death. Oh Lord, deliver us, deliver this world from the grip of the evil one, from the grip of fallenness, Lord, we see 
even this week in the news, so much brokenness across our world. We pray for the Israeli-Palestine conflict that seems to have just kicked off again, and it's just so awful. Isaiah said, there will be a day when they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. Lord, when we see the strife and the brokenness, we long for the coming of Jesus Christ who will make it all right again. But Lord, we pray for peace in Jerusalem peace between Israelis and Palestinians, and that your kingdom would come to all of those groups. We pray for India this morning, continuing to be rocked with this new variant, and now it seems to be here in the UK, and we just pray again for the restraining of the influence of that variant. We pray for Mohan and Nathika, uh, who've been touched as Mohan has uh, lost uh, his sister through this crisis, and we just pray for your comfort for Mohan and Nathika this morning and their families. Lord, we think of the churches in our Baptist association across the south of this island today, the churches in the Republic being allowed to open this morning for the first time in a long time. Oh, bless our brothers and sisters in their gatherings. And not just in the Baptist churches, but Lord, across all groups who are gathering and naming Jesus, bless your church. And Lord, for ourselves, the things that concern us this morning, you know all about them. We just pray for one another. We remember Hugo McKillen as he continues to recover from surgery, and Maureen Henry and as she recovers from her surgery. We remember William McCormick this morning. We remember others who are unwell. We remember those who are caring for aging parents. Lord, for those this morning who are in our midst who might be anxious or depressed or just struggling, oh Lord, just touch us, Lord, where we need touched. And we pray for this evening for our service and for Emma and Stephen as they prepare to be baptized. We pray that, Lord, in your grace and in your mercy, your power would be known in this service. And if, if people do indeed come, Lord, that don't know you, oh Lord, save them. And we pray this morning as we gather and as we turn again to Mark's gospel in just a little while and, and just see how Jesus can touch us in the place that concerns us, we just pray that you'd encourage our hearts this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, if you have your Bible, please do turn with me to Mark's gospel. I'm going to read from Mark 8, verse 11 to 21. Now, it was my goal to get to the halfway point in Mark's gospel before the summer, before the end of June, so I'm a few weeks ahead of schedule, which is great. I'm going to preach this morning in this passage, and then next Sunday morning, God willing, in the spine of the book of Mark, the very center of the whole book, and then we're going to take a break uh, over the summer, and then I'm going to pick up the second half of the book, God willing, in September and finish it out uh, over the months through the autumn. So we've been in this series since October, uh, and I think it would be good then to take a little break for our summer period. We're going to do a summer series on Psalms of Joy, starting with Psalm 100. Serve the Lord with gladness. I'm really looking forward to that. But this morning, we come to the last part of the first part of the book of Mark. So Mark 8, verse 11. The Pharisees came and began to argue with him, that is, with Jesus, seeking from him a sign from heaven to test him. And he sighed deeply in his spirit and said, why does this generation seek a sign? Truly, I say to you, no sign will be given to this generation. And he left them, got into the boat again, and went to the other side Now they had forgotten to bring bread, and they had only one loaf with them in the boat. And he cautioned them, saying, watch out, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and of the leaven of Herod. And they began discussing with one another the fact that they had no bread. 
And Jesus, aware of this, said to them, Why are you discussing the fact that you have no bread? Do you not perceive or understand? Are your hearts hardened? Having eyes, do you not see? And having ears, do you not hear? And do you not remember? When I broke the five loaves for the 5,000, how many baskets full of broken pieces did you take up? They said to him, 12. And the seven for the 4,000? How many baskets full of broken pieces did you take up? And they said to him, seven. And he said to them, do you not yet understand? This is the word of the Lord. Well, we're going to sing again of the strength of Christ that dwells within us. Yet not I, but through Christ in me. Let's stand and praise the Lord together.
be seated. Kids uh, and young people, you can make your way out to your class now. I hope you have a lovely time out in Sunday school. Uh, I'll be praying for you now as you go and learn God's word. And as the kids make their way out, uh, please do open your Bible with me to Mark's gospel. Uh, it'll be helpful for you to have it open in front of you. And I'm just going to pray again and ask for God to shine his light on his word and on our hearts. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the blessing of our togetherness. And as we come uh, to open your word, we know that all scripture is breathed out by God, so we're opening the breath of God. And I just pray, Father, by your spirit, you'd be pleased to breathe on us. Show us your son and encourage our hearts and Lord, nourish us together. We need fresh bread from you. And we just pray that you would build us up together in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, back at the beginning of this series, I explained that Mark's gospel is a very well-organized gospel. It consists of 16 chapters that are divided equally into two halves and held together by a hinge, or perhaps better, a spine that binds the whole gospel together. It's a very satisfying gospel to read just on a literary level, although we know it's much more than that. We have seen so far the first half of this gospel, and in the first half, we get Jesus' ministry in and around Galilee. That's chapter 1 to chapter 8, verse 21. Then in the second half, from chapter 9 to 16, the second eight chapters, we will see Jesus setting his face towards Jerusalem and making his way to the cross. That's what the second half of this book is given to. And then in the central section... What we're going to be in next week, from chapter 8, verse 22 to 9, 1, you get the spine of the book that holds the whole thing together, the hinge around which the whole book turns, and at the center of that, Jesus asks this question, who do you say I am? And that really is the theme of the whole book. So it's so satisfying to see the big scale organization of the gospel. And that helps us to see that this morning, we are in the very last passage of the first half of the gospel. And so it's no surprise to see that the section we're in this morning serves as a bit of a summary of the first half of the book. What is the essence of the summary? Well, I would summarize it like this. As we approach the half where point in the gospel, we will see that both Jesus' opponents and Jesus' disciples, they still have a lot to learn. That's the message of the summary of the first half of Mark's gospel. We see this summary text, verses 11 to 21, it's clearly broken up itself into two sections. If you look down at it there, you'll see verses 11 to 13, we get a summary of where Jesus' opponents are at with respect to their understanding of Jesus. Not a surprise, the Pharisees, the religious clergy of the day, they're still closed and antagonistic towards Jesus, as they have been throughout the first eight chapters of the book. But then in the second part of the summary, verses 14 to 21, we get the summary of where Jesus' disciples are at with respect to their understanding of Jesus. And to be honest, this section is a bit more surprising in some way, ways. Because if you think about it, the disciples, think of all they've seen so far in this gospel. The feedings of the 5,000 and the 4,000. The healings, the teaching, the authority that Jesus has demonstrated over the elements, over the demons. 
the journeys across the sea, but by the end of this section, we're going to see that the disciples still don't really get what it means to have Jesus in the boat with you. They still don't get what it means to have Jesus in their lives. We're going to see them get all stressed in this text, like we get all stressed at times. They're going to get stressed over something fairly trivial. Actually, of all things, do you know what they get stressed about in this text? Bread. And if you think about what we've been looking at over the past couple of weeks, the feeding of the 5,000, the feeding of the 4,000, if there's anything they didn't need to be stressed about, it was bread. They should have learned not to worry about bread. But we'll see in this text they get all bent out of shape over the fact that someone forgot to pack the bread for their next journey. They're still not grasping what it really means to have Jesus in the boat with them. And the whole summary closes with Jesus asking them this barrage of questions, but I think the final one in verse 21 really captures the essence of where we are to close the first half of Mark's gospel. Jesus asks them this, do you not yet understand? And that's the question that's at the heart of this message this morning and that I really want you to hear Jesus asking you through his word and the power of his spirit this morning. For though we may look on this morning and think, boy, those disciples were slow on the uptake. We can be so like them. How many things have we seen in our lives in the past that have troubled us and God has faithfully come through time and time and time again? And yet, aren't we so quick again to get anxious about those same things? that he showed himself to be faithful in in the past. We can still get so stressed out and concerned about many things, and the Lord knows that. So I want, as we begin this morning, I want you each to think just now of one situation in your life that is concerning you. Something that might be filling your thoughts a bit, or that's draining quite a bit of emotional energy out of you. Just think, what's the thing in my life that right now is concerning me, filling up my mind, and I find it hard even this morning perhaps to concentrate because it's just, there's no headspace. It's just, this is concerning me. I want you to think about that. And my prayer is that you're going to hear the voice of Jesus speak to you through his word this morning, saying, do you not yet understand? You can trust me with this. So, we're going to look at the two parts of the text. Move quite quickly over the first part in 11 to 13 and spend the most of our time on the second part. And I want you to be asking yourself, do I really get what it means to have Jesus in the boat with me with this thing that concerns me? So, Let's see. Verses 11 to 13. Put a heading over this. Jesus' opponents still have a lot to learn. After Jesus' journeys in the Gentile regions around Galilee that we saw over the past couple of weeks, Jesus now returns closer to home. And in verse 11, look at what we see. The Pharisees came and began to argue with him. We've seen the Pharisees, the religious leaders of the day, arguing with Jesus a lot in this gospel already. Back in chapter 2, do you remember how they questioned questioned Jesus' authority to pronounce forgiveness of sins? In chapter 3, they challenged his willingness to heal on the Sabbath and thought that was quite inappropriate. In fact, at that point, we're told that they plotted the Pharisees with the Herodians, the followers, loyal subjects to King Herod, the king of the day, they actually plotted how they could destroy Jesus, take him out, discredit him, get rid of him. Then in chapter 7, we read of the Pharisees being frustrated that Jesus' disciples weren't following the traditions of the elders. And here now in chapter 8, we see them again, 
And they're arguing with Jesus. What are they arguing about? Well, they're goading Jesus to give them a sign from heaven. They want Jesus to, to show them something to authenticate your ministry and, and, and a sign directly from God that they'll not be mistaken. As if they haven't seen enough powerful signs in this gospel, they're now seeking more. But look carefully at the end of verse 11, for there we read that their motives were not with an openness to being convinced about Jesus' true identity, but they were seeking this sign we read to test him. There were their motives. Let's see if this will give us a way to discredit him. That's the posture of their heart towards Jesus. You know the word for test? Here, it doesn't come up much in Mark's gospel. It's the same word that was used back in chapter 1, verse 13, for Satan's testing Jesus in the wilderness. The Pharisees are so caught up with their own concerns, their own position and prestige, that they have totally closed their hearts to Jesus. How does Jesus respond to their request for a sign? We'll look at verse 12. He sighs deeply. You could imagine just that big. <sighs> Why does this generation seek a sign? Truly, I say to you, no sign will be given to this generation. This is a sigh of grief and anger at their hardness of heart and their unwillingness to open their hearts to who Jesus really is. Jesus, knowing that hardness, will not countenance their request because it's not genuine. And so in verse 13, we simply read, and he left them. He would not give them a sign. He got into the boat again and went to the other side. And I think we're to, to detect a note of finality in that statement, and he left them. This is, in a sense, Jesus dusting the, the, the dust off his sandals so that he can move on to a new place. He said back in chapter 4, verse 24, about openness to his teaching, he said, with the measure you use, it'll be measured on to you. The one who's open and attentive will receive more. But to the one who is closed, whose ears are closed and who's hard, even what he has will be taken away, Jesus said. You know, this is the last time in the Gospel of Mark where we read of Jesus speaking with the Galilean Pharisees. I think there's something instructive for us here. Jesus is so patient and gracious, but he will not strive forever with those who keep closing their heart to him. Perhaps the Lord has been speaking to you over the first eight chapters of this series. You might be a Christian. You may be a person who is not a Christian. Perhaps in some way the Lord has been speaking to you in some of the messages. You think back to some of them. I, I encouraged you to, to, to get out of the boat of your comfort zone and, and step out and see Jesus standing in sovereign glory over the water. Think of some of the messages or some of the ways Jesus has been speaking to you through his word. But maybe you've been closing your heart. Maybe at the time you've been committing and saying, Lord, I want to, to, to follow you. I want to obey. I want to, I want to come to you. I want to give my life to you. But then the dust has settled in the morning and you're eating your lunch and you've forgotten all about it. For those who don't know Jesus, and perhaps you've heard him speaking to you over this past number of weeks or months. But you've kept closing your heart to him. Maybe this morning, he's knocking on the door of your heart again. I want to encourage you and admonish you. Do not keep ignoring his call. Do not keep closing your heart to him. For the time may come when you will no longer hear the knocking. 
So we leave the Pharisees in Galilee at this point. And what's the summary? Wow, we still have a lot to learn. But now we come to the second part of the summary. We move on from thinking of Jesus' opponents still having a lot to learn to now seeing that Jesus' disciples are open, but boy, they still have so much to learn. Look at verse 14. We're back in a scene that is very familiar. Jesus is in the boat with his disciples, and they are on the move to a new place. Just as a little side for a moment, you know, in the boat with Jesus is a key setting in Mark's gospel. It'd be a fun thing to kind of just look at the few different accounts where the disciples are found in the boat with Jesus and the things that happen. Think of the calming of the storm. Think of Jesus walking to them on the sea. Think of some of the incredible lessons they learn in the boat with Jesus. And here now we're back in the place where often key lessons about the identity of Jesus are learned. And that you kind of put your sensors up, okay, there's going to be something here. Key for disciples to learn. Well, let's look at what that lesson is. In the boat with Jesus, the narrative begins with a problem. It's a very human problem, a very annoying problem. They forgot to pack bread for the journey of the day. Now, you can imagine the scene here, and I really want you to try and enter into this because I get how they were feeling right now. Think of it. They're making their way across the Sea of Galilee. It's a nice day. All's going well. They're looking forward to what's ahead, excited, thinking back on the feeding of the 4,000. Wow, he fed 4,000 people with just a few loaves and a few fish. He fed 5,000 people with just a few loaves and a few fish. Amazing. They're having a great time. They're crossing the Sea of Galilee. And then you could imagine Simon Peter saying, here, guys, I'm a wee bit peckish. Could someone pass me some of the bread? And then James, for example, says to Simon Peter, yeah, yeah, sure. Where is it? Who packed it? And you can imagine where it might go. James, who packed the bread, John responds, I think Andrew was the one to look after on this particular trip. And so they turned to Andrew. Andrew? Andrew, no, I didn't pack it. It wasn't my turn. Philip? No. Thaddeus, Judas, any of you guys packed the bread? And they're like, no, I didn't pack it. It wasn't my responsibility. You could see how this would go. Simon Peter could well have turned to look at them and said, right, hang on, so you're telling me there are seven crates of bread left over from that feeding, and you've only managed, between all of you, you've only managed to put one loaf in the boat? I'm hungry now. I wonder if you've ever been on one of those excursions. This, this happens in our household, and I'll not mention any names. You know where you sort of pack the lunch, and you, you anticipate going through the morning, and then will come the point where you have your lunch, but at about 10 a.m., someone's like, but I'm lunch hungry now. You can imagine Simon Peter like that, but I'm lunch hungry now, and there's one loaf for all of us. They're like kids. Well, you can imagine in this very human situation, and I, I would be frustrated if I was there, Jesus speaks in with this solemn and yet compassionate word in verse 15, and he cautioned them saying, Watch out, beware the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. So there's some kind of play on the situation going on. They're worried about physical bread. And Jesus is saying, beware this leaven, an old word for yeast. Beware the subtle yeasty influence of the Pharisees and of King Herod. Let's just think for a wee moment about what Jesus might be saying to them here. You've got to acknowledge again, it's a little parable, a little word picture. Leaven is that old word for yeast. You know that yeast, you put in a tiny bit in bread and it just pervades the whole thing. This picture of yeast or leaven is used across the Bible, often in a negative way, to speak of the, the, the all-pervasive influence of worldly ways of thinking. 
little thoughts, little attitudes that can lodge in your mind and actually have a pervasive influence on your whole life. In 1 Corinthians chapter 5, for example, the Apostle Paul warns of the danger of a proud, self-sufficient attitude. And he says, be careful, don't you know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? Just a little bit of that proud, uh, arrogant self-sufficiency, just a little bit can have a massive influence on your whole life, your whole outlook. Well, what's possibly the leaven, the wrong attitude of the Pharisees and of Herod that could exert the pervasive influence on the disciples? I think it's this. Both the Pharisees and the, uh, and the king Herod in this gospel, they are more concerned about building their own kingdoms than they are about building the kingdom of God. The Pharisees we've already seen are consumed with a kind of nationalistic pride. Herod is consumed with securing his rule and establishing his position as a royal ruler. And both groups, Herod and the Pharisees, they're so caught up in their own agenda that they have failed to see what was in front of them in the person of Jesus Christ. I'm going to say that again. They were so caught up with their own agenda that they failed to see Christ's agenda for them. Does that kind of leaven ever influence your thinking? Jesus says to his disciples in this moment, oh, watch out for the subtle yet pervasive influence of being so caught up in your own stuff that you miss my agenda for you. Now, you would think that the disciples might take this on board and say, Jesus, thank you for that warning. That's so important. Thank you. But they don't. <laughs> Look at verse 16, their response to Jesus' word. And they began discussing with one another the fact that they had no bread. And you just want to go, oh. They just go right back to Peter. You were the one that was supposed to look after the bread. There's no bread. And they totally are so caught up with their own stuff that they totally miss the lesson. I wonder, do we ever do that? You ever had that moment where you're flapping, <laughs> flapping about something, and later on you look back and you go, oh, why did I flap for so long and forget the Lord? You flap, flap, flap. And then you settle for a moment, and you're like, okay, let's pray. <laughs> I really encourage you, try to reduce the flap time. <laughs> It'll save you a lot of grief. Oh, I just, you just see them, you're disappointed, and then you sort of think, oh, but that's me. <laughs> they began discussing with one another again the fact that they had no bread. And how does Jesus respond to them? You can sort of sense, can't you, the sigh of Jesus from the previous account with the Pharisees. A, oh, okay. You can sense it carrying forward into this account. But I just want to read Jesus' response in verses 17 to 21. Let, let's listen to it together. And let's hear it falling again on our hearts in all the things we're concerned about. After they go back to their escalating argument about the bread, Jesus just says in verse 17, why are you discussing the fact that you have no bread? Do you not yet perceive or understand? Are your hearts hardened? Having eyes do you not see and having ears do you not hear? And do you not remember? When I broke the five loaves for the 5,000, how many baskets full of broken pieces did you take up? And they said to him, 12. And the seven for the 4,000, how many baskets full of broken pieces did you take up? And they said to him, seven. And he said to them, do you not yet 
understand. What is it that Jesus means? What is it they're not understanding? Jesus is saying, do you not yet understand that I will look after you? I will supply your needs, even in this. He may not always do it the way we would want him to do it. But Jesus says, do you not understand that you can rest in me as your good shepherd, even with this? Do you not yet understand that you don't have to stress so much about this thing that concerns you? Do you not understand, turning that slightly, do you not understand that there are more important things, perhaps, that should be filling your minds? Don't you understand that the priorities of the kingdom should be dominating your thoughts more than all these other concerns? Don't you understand that I want you to live in the goodness of all I am for you? I want you to rest in the goodness of what it means to have me in the boat with you. Imagine if you were facing this thing without me. I want you to rest in the goodness of having me in the boat. Will you rest? Or will you stress as if I'm not even in the boat? Don't you understand? Don't you remember? He says to the disciples, the feeding of the 5,000, did I leave you out then? Or the feeding of the 4,000, did I leave you out then? No, there was always a basket for you. And there will always be a basket of my resources for you. In any and every situation, There will always be a basket of resources for you. Do you not yet understand? Now, that's the text. I just want us to pull back for a moment and just ask the question, is this just some accurate historical account that stands here for us so that we know what happened. It's just pure history, great, well recorded. It's nice to know what happened. Is that just what this is? Is this just recorded history? Well, no, it's not. It's so much more than that. It is historical truth, but it is written down for our instruction. This is here for us this morning. So what are we to learn from the summary so far? Jesus' disciples still have so much to learn. What do we learn from that? I have just drawn out two points of application with which I want to close. Two lessons from this narrative that I hope we'll be able to take away with us. That'll be like nice handles so you can carry this message into your week. Lesson one coming out of this account. Beware the mistake of misordered concerns. I picked every word there intentionally. It's not disordered concerns, because that means no order. Misordered, ordered in the wrong order. Beware the mistake of misordered concerns. What do I mean with that? Well, Jesus says in this account to his disciples, Here is something that you should be concerned about. This leaven, this subtle, pervasive, worldly influence that can make you forget that I'm in the boat, that can make you forget that I am sovereign, that can make you forget that my kingdom rules over all. Beware that, that leaven that just can pervade so quickly. That's what you should be concerned about. That's the first concern. Your first concern 
should be about the things of the kingdom of God. Our first concerns this morning, and I will put a few little qualifiers in just in a moment, but our first concern should always be to fight for the seek first the kingdom of God attitude in our lives. We should be asking ourselves, am I enjoying God? Am I sharing in Christ's mission? Am I walking closely with the Lord and keeping in step with the Spirit? Is my mind full of truth that will influence me more than the leaven of the world? The disciples were so focused on their physical bread problem that they couldn't even hear Jesus' invitation. Don't just think of the physical bread problem. Remember the spiritual problems. Beware, be concerned about them. In some ways, the disciples in the boat here with Jesus are like Martha in Luke's gospel. Remember, Martha's so concerned with the physical needs, flapping around all in a fluster, she couldn't settle to think on spiritual things. Jesus said, Martha, Martha. You are anxious and troubled about many things, but one thing is necessary. Now, we all know that the practical things of life need our attention. Yes. I often summarize the account of Mary and Martha saying, just look at their names. There's half of Mary in every Martha, and there's half of Martha in every Mary. That's the point of that story, by the way. It's to qualify and rein in the idea that the Christian life is all work, 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 outward work, 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 work. And you get the Mary account to rein you in and say, no, 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 of course, you've got to be committed, you've got to work, you've got to look after your practical responsibilities. But remember what comes first. The Lord sitting at his feet, having your mind and heart shaped by him. So, I know some of you this morning have some massive concerns in your life. And I know it is not easy to just say, don't worry about those things. Just seek first the kingdom. That's not what I'm saying. It's not that easy. I'm saying what I believe this passage teaches is beware the mistake of misordered concerns. Your concerns are, yeah, are real. Yes, absolutely. But if you let them take first place, you will drown under them. But if you can fight and swim and fight with the help that the Lord gives you, say, Lord, this is all consuming me right now. I can hardly think about anything else. But Lord, help me to order it under you. Help me. I can't do it myself. Help me to seek first your kingdom, to want to honor you, even in this, as I go for the surgery or as I, as I go into the, that, that dark night that looks like death. Lord, may your name be glorified. Let me have ordered concerns that I be concerned first for your glory, for your honor, for what you're doing, even in this. And then under that, then I'll be ready to address all the other concerns. But Lord, help me not to get them in the wrong order because then I'll, I'll drown. So whether that concern is for your lost son or daughter or whether that concern is about your health or your family member or whether you're just racked with anxiety and depression, whatever it is, try with the help of the Lord to fight to keep the kingdom concerns first and say, Lord, I can only deal with this if you're first. Get the concerns in order if you can with the help of the Lord. That's what Jesus when, says when he says, look, you're, you guys are all bent out of shape, out of the bread. But here you, you need to worry more about this bready influence that could destroy your soul. So beware the mistake of misordered concerns. That's the first lesson. The second, hopefully comforting for you. Learn to rest your fret-filled soul in the loving care of Jesus. In the barrage of questions that Jesus asked his disciples when they were fretting over the bread, 
there are two questions really that stand as headings and all the other questions hang off them. The first heading is at the end of verse 18 when Jesus asks the disciples, do you not remember? He's saying to his fretful disciples, and he says to you this morning, look back over the journey of your life with me so far. Have I not proved myself to be faithful? Caring for you in your times of plenty and in your times of need. Being patient with you when you drifted and faded. Have I ever failed to keep my promise that I will be with you always? Look back. Remember concrete moments in your life where you were under the cosh. Can we not discern a steady, sovereign, loving, faithful hand ordering it all? Have you forgotten? Do you not remember? And let this speak to you what Jesus says. When I broke the five loaves for the 5,000, it looked so overwhelming and the resources looked so weak. But did I not come through? And you apply that to the own, your own situations in your own life. Jesus says each time, how many baskets full of broken pieces did you take up? There's always been a basket of resources for you. And there always will be, no matter what. And this is here because God graciously wants us to learn to rest. Oh, rest your soul in the faithful love of Jesus for you. The second key question that he asks them, that all the others hang off, is this one that I started everything off with. Do you not yet understand? And this really is the close of the first act of Mark's gospel. Do you not understand what? That I love you. That is what Jesus is saying in essence here. I don't know if you find this hard. Sometimes I find it hard to rest in the love of the Lord. I find it quite an abstract concept at times. And when I'm praying in the morning, I just, I'll say, Lord, help me to feel loved. And then I'll say, but Lord, I don't know if the word feel is that good for this moment. I just want to know your love. Help me to experience, not to be always feeling so worthless or so guilty and that I'm so poor. Help me just to experience this incredible love, to know it, understand it truthfully in my mind, yes, but for the understanding to stir the affections. Jesus is saying, do you not understand that I love you? I am committed to you. It will be okay. This thing, whatever came into your mind this morning when I asked for you to think of something that's concerning you right now, Jesus says, do you not understand? I am with you in this. I'll never leave you in it. It's going to be hard. There's going to be ups and downs. Absolutely. In all of this, there is a design. In all of this, I will love you. In all of this, I will sanctify you. And I will bring you home where there will be no more suffering at all. Do you not yet understand that I love you? Do you remember when the disciples were in the boat in the middle of the storm, rowing hard and not getting anywhere? And Jesus walks into that situation and he just says, Take heart, I am here. 
Jesus says that to us this morning and says, do you not yet understand? You can trust me even with this thing that is consuming you right now. The disciples were slow to learn. Do you know it's not going to be actually until Jesus' death where the penny drops for them? He must love us because he went through that for us. And if he went through that for us to deal with the biggest problems in our lives, surely he is for us. We can conclude he loves us, he's for us. If the Father did not spare his own Son, but graciously gave him up for us all, how will he not now, along with him, graciously give us all things? There'll always be a basket of resources for you, for whatever it is that concerns you. Whether it's looking out onto the future and you just see perhaps a son that you're concerned about, you're like, what will, what will happen with this? There'll be a basket of resources for you. Whether it's that sickness and the future that just looks so scary to you, there will always be a basket of resources for you. Do you not yet understand? They were so caught up over the one bread, the one loaf said, we don't have any bread. Jesus says, I am your true bread. Do you not yet understand? For any who will receive Jesus into the boat of their lives, he will come to you. He will take all your sins away. He will be your loving shepherd and he will guide you forever. You know, in Psalm 37, we have this lovely word, fret not. I just feel the need to just sit on this for a moment. Fret not, O oh faint-hearted Christian. Instead of fretting, Psalm 37 gives us a list of things we should do, and it starts with this. Trust in the Lord. Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust in him, and he will act. Fret not, brother and sister. Fret not. Jesus is in the boat with you, and he's never getting out. <laughs> oh, praise the Lord for his goodness. Let's pray. Father, what a joy it is just now to be able to reflect on this and respond by sharing in the Lord's Supper. Because, Lord, we're going to embrace and receive now again this incredible symbol, the bread of life that satisfies the deepest needs of our soul, the death of Jesus and his glorious resurrection that gives us new life, and the risen Jesus who says, I will be with you always, no matter what, to the end of the age. Oh Lord, thank you. And as we respond, I just pray, Lord, and I just sense it deep in my heart and spirit this morning for the person sitting here that has come in with deep concerns. Oh Lord, I just pray that you would be speaking even now lifting them and showing them the resources in you for them, even with this. And Lord, as we sing and we respond, just continue now by the power of your Spirit to teach us and speak to us. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we are going to move now straight into remembering the Lord and the Lord's Supper now. I'd ask you just uh, to be ready uh, with the bread and the cup in just a few moments, but we're going to sing the first two verses of this lovely communion hymn, Behold the Lamb. Let's stand together and sing this, and let's just be again prayerful as we sing these words and approach the Lord.
remembering him in the way he's appointed. John 6, 51, Jesus said,